All right, good morning, good morning. As people are shuffling in, welcome to Oak Bridge City. I am excited to be here today, excited to sing, excited to celebrate, and uh, excited to hear a message from uh, my dad, Pastor Herc, so I'm looking forward uh, to that. But first things first, we're coming down to the wire. How many of you guys watched games last night? Raise your hand. Okay, awesome. How many of you guys were rooting for North Carolina? Okay, yeah. How many of you guys were rooting for Duke? Okay, I was rooting for UNC pretty hard. Caleb Love is a St. Louis boy, and I have too many friends who like Duke, and so I was pulling for North Carolina. Uh, I, I need to honor just a couple people as we um, get ready to dive in. Uh, it, we, we mentioned this right now, first place. First place, uh, we can kind of see who's going to win at this point in our bracket. Mo S. Mo S. has Duke winning. Right now, they have 990 points. Uh, they were not in the room last week. If they do not reveal themselves, second place will be getting the gift card next week. All right? Uh, uh, don't see you. Is... Is my wife, Abby Noblet, in the room? Abby Noblet, no, she's serving down in the cafe, not in here yet. Uh, she's in second place. Again, I told you it was rigged. It was rigged for us to get the gift card. So second place might be getting it. And then uh, Brett Ackerman, Brett Ackerman, is he in the room? If Kansas wins, which you gotta like Kansas' chances, Brett Ackerman is going to take home the trophy. Uh, last place, last place, we will honor you next week as well. Ray West, Ray West, looks like we're having a good showing this morning from people who have done the brackets. Uh, Jordan Sims, we're going to keep going down the line. Norris's, are the Norris's in the room? There we go, yes. The, we honored you last week. You, are, you will be getting the last place trophy, I think, big guy. Um, and so congratulations on a terrible bracket. Um, so anyways, I'm excited to sing. I'm excited to celebrate. Um, let's give God our best today. Why don't you guys stand up and say a prayer for us, and we're going to go to God in worship. Uh, Father, we love you. And God, I know right now for every single person in this room, uh, there's something going on outside of these walls that might, demand, that might even demand our attention, uh, some heavy stuff, some stressful stuff. And Lord, I just pray that by your spirit, uh, we can give you our devotion this morning. We can give you our praise this morning. Uh, we can give you a sacrifice of praise with our lips. Uh, we can offer up holy hands to you today uh, in celebration of who you are uh, as we honor you, as we surrender to you again. Uh, we love you, uh, and I just pray that all of us can connect with you in a special way today, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in worship.
God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. signal fire of grace 
If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain. No syllable empty your voice. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. A hundred billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you say If it all reveals your nature, so will I I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, the canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I. So. So will I 
like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. You all can take a seat for a moment. That's a great song that really tells us the story of God uh, from beginning all the way up till the death, resurrection of Jesus, and even hints at the fact that he's going to return. He's going to come back. And uh, I don't know about you, but this is a season uh, where each year, not saying it should be this way or shouldn't be this way, but as, as we kind of begin to prepare our hearts for Good Friday, as we prepare our hearts for Easter, as it's the, the Lenten season, this is a season where my eyes are particularly set on the event of the cross. Uh, the love of God expressed on a torture tool for both you and for me. And uh, every year I know I'm reminded, uh, I can even sense it in my spirit, that I, I, I need this story. I mean, I need this story. It's what we've really talked about over the last nine weeks. This story, this gospel message that we claim our allegiance to is not just a story that, that is needed for the person in the room who doesn't know God, although you need it. But this is a story where the Apostle Paul says, you need to believe her. You need to be enraptured with this story. You need to be engulfed in this story. You need to boast in this story. You need to obsess over this story. You need to center your whole life on the story of God, that he became a man, that he died, that he rose again, that he's coming back. And because we need this story, I believe that we need this. Like, I, I hope, we've been doing this every week for a while now, like, I hope doing this every week doesn't make this, like, less special and important and weighty. I mean, we're taking of the sacraments that represent the tortured, broken body of the God-man who we, we claim is Savior, and we take of the wine that represents his blood that was viciously poured out for your forgiveness and for mine. And so I want you guys just to take a moment on your own to reflect, um, to think on this story, um, to be somber, but also be celebratory here. This is a cross that purchases us purchases for us forever, but I want us to think on this, and, and then I'll lead us in communion here in just a moment. Jesus, you say that at the Last Supper, you go with your disciples, you say that you longed to, to, to share this meal with them, that you looked forward to sit and have this Passover and, 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 and you were instituting something. But Lord, I, I, I pray that, that even that challenges me, that it, that it challenges us, that it challenges our desires. Do we long to take of this bread and drink of this wine? Do we look forward to this? Do we desire you above all else? Do we love you? Do we pursue you above everything else in this life? Lord, help us look inward in regards to that. 
Jesus, you said at this supper that one among, that one among you was going to deny you. That, that even the scene where you institute this last supper brings about this thought of, of allegiance. Are we with you? Are we, are we for you? Are we saying that no matter what this life brings, we're, we're, we're gonna stay with you? Lord, I pray that we look inward and check our allegiance. And Lord, you say that this is your body, that this is your blood. Lord, is this our sustenance? Do we understand that we are fully, as feeble human beings, dependent on you? We need you. You're the bread of life. You are living water. Apart from you, there is no life at all. Do we live as if this is our reality? Lord, I pray that the, that the communion table here with our brothers and sisters in Christ, in this room, I pray that it challenges us to look inward and ask ourselves, are we living lives that are worthy of this gospel that we have received? Lord, I pray that these next few moments as we take of the bread and the wine and as we sing about the, the passion of the cross, I pray that that helps that it spurs us on to love, to good deeds, and to the life that you've called us to, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, you can uh, kind of peel off that top layer, and uh, I'll lead us here in just a moment. If you're ready, and if you're able, and if you're a believer in Jesus, if you're not, we ask you to withhold from taking uh, the sacrament. Um, but if you're a believer in the room, uh, let's take of the bread together, which represents his broken body given for you. And let's take of the cup, which represents his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Now I just ask and I plead uh, that we would sing as if we believe this story is true. Let's stand up and let's continue on in worship.
Dear Jesus, we are so grateful for the cross. Um, let us not forget that today. Let us who know the story and have accepted this story, let us walk freely in that truth. Let that guide our whole lives and every choice that we make. Let us live lives that are worthy of the cross. We thank you for everyone who is in this room, every single heart. I just pray that we have open eyes and open ears for this message today. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name. Amen. Good morning. How are we all doing this morning? Doing good? Good. There goes. I've been looking forward to coming here all week. Um, I don't get a chance to get down here very often. It's pretty cool to see how, how it just grows every single time I'm here. Got a few props. Thanks for that. Um, um, but excited to talk this morning. And um, I know you guys have been spending uh, some time in Galatians here recently. By the way, I, I think Josh mentioned, but I'm Herc Noblet. Um, I, and again, part of the reason I like coming down here is I love basketball. I guess I didn't. I'm supposed to release the kids, right? Yeah, a little different over here. So go ahead, you guys. So, uh, but love basketball. When I came down here earlier, Josh was always giving an update on his on his grade school team. So gives an update here. I like competition, so I think it's cool that you guys got the brackets and and all those things. And again, I'm Herc Noblet. Sometimes when I sign in on things, I use the name Moes. I, I don't know. <laughs> Mystery might be solved. My, my son's a little slow. He's staring at me like that whole time. Like what's going on? But. Um, but we're going to spend some time in here. I, I like this. Um, and, and, you know, the Bible contains some crazy things. We believe some crazy stuff. And, and um, like I said, Josh has been going over for the last nine weeks, I think, through the book of Galatians, which would um, be down over in this section of the Bible. Today we're going to be talking about this first section. Um, it's called the Pentateuch or the, the Law of Moses, and we'll primarily be in here. It's foundational um, to what goes on for the entire rest of the Old Testament. And then we know that the Old Testament, actually, it, all of it is, is explaining and foreshadowing what's to come in Jesus Christ. And then we get to the latter part of the New Testament, which Josh has been speaking on. That kind of tells us, in light of this whole story, how we're to live, what we're to believe, how things are to go. And again, he's been spending nine weeks on Galatians, which I think is, what, six chapters, Josh? Right? Tom is over at Arnold, and he's been spending um, almost a year on, on the book of Romans, and, and still has several chapters to go. I'm going to take you this morning through 40 years of Jewish history, several, several chapters in here. Again, they spend nine weeks on six chapters, Tom a year on 12. I don't know what that says. Maybe they're a little slow. I don't, I don't know. Or maybe they're just more thorough. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But, and we're going to be talking primarily in Exodus. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. The first book, Genesis, sets everything up. In Genesis, we get creation. We see how sin destroyed all kinds of things, the, the relationship that we have with creation, the relationship we have with God, the relationship we have with one another. We see in Genesis how God took a man named Abraham and had a plan to fix this whole thing and to restore us um, back to the right relationship with God. And he made Abraham some promises. He said, I'm going to turn you into a great nation, your descendants into a great nation. I'm going to give you a land, and, and you're going to bless the entire world through um, the people that come after you. So we see that, and then, and then um, we, we read about Isaac, his son, and Jacob, and Joseph. And through a series of events, when we get to the end of Genesis, we see that the people of God, this chosen people that, that he is starting to, to produce, to create, to be a light to the whole world, that they've made their way to, to Egypt. And now when we pick up the story here in Exodus, they've been in bondage, they've been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And now we get to Exodus, and it's the time for the people to be released. It's the time for God to bring his people out of Egyptian captivity, out of slavery, into the promised land. So I just want to, before we even get going, kind of make a quick summary here about the journey that they're going to go on that takes them crazily 40 years, 40 years of journey into the promised land. So I think we've got a map that they can, they can pull up, right? So the, the people of God now are in Egypt, this nation that he's starting to create, and the goal is to get to Canaan, the promised land. Right? But we read in the story um, that, 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 that we could see that obviously the easiest way to go would have gone right from Egypt to Canaan. That's about a 200-mile journey. Um, but for them to do that, the road would have taken them along the Mediterranean Sea there. And it was kind of a dangerous travel through, Mount si I mean, through the Sinai Peninsula there. Um, there were some Philistines and even some Egyptian um, forces that would have been along the line. So God, instead of taking them that direct route, from Egypt to Canaan, again, a, a travel distance of about 200 miles, he instead takes them south, down towards Mount Sinai. Right? 
And so um, this is a, a thing that, that really should have taken a matter of weeks, but it takes a long time. Um, so we're going to start off in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. So it says this, When Pharaoh said, let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. So he didn't take them in that direct route. That route, again, was heavily fortified and, and stuff. But God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. So he brought them south, right? God led them down that way. They weren't ready to fight. They weren't ready to, to face some of the things that would have been waiting for them in that dangerous trip through the Sinai Peninsula. So he brings them down to, to Mount Sinai. We don't know exactly where that's it, but it's probably in the southern portion of the Sinai Peninsula. Brings them there. He's got some, some lessons to teach them in the wilderness and the promised land. They're down in Mount Sinai. They've been there for about a year. And he just, God decides it's time for them to head north. He tells the people that he's going to lead and go before them. Um, he's going to lead in a cloud by day and in fire by night. They're going to see his presence. And we get to Deuteronomy chapter 1. And again, now he's, he's calling them from Mount Sinai up to the promised land. And we read this, a journey that should have taken this long. It says, it takes 11 days to go from Horeb, and Horeb would have been another name from Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh Barney is in the boundary of the promised land that they were going. So it was supposed to take them 11 days, 11 days. They're excited about this, an 11-day trip to the promised land. But you know how long it took them to get from, from Mount Sinai up to the promised land? Another 39 years. 39 years they wandered around in that wilderness and in the desert. And the first point I want to make this morning, God's not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. This is often difficult for us, right? We want to get to the place that we go, but God's primary concern in our lives is not speed. Ours often is. Right? Maybe going on vacation. Anybody here, they go on vacation, you have kids and you drive, right? and you take off and you're about 15 minutes away from home, and what's the first question we start to get? Are we there yet? Right? Are we there yet? We take a bunch of students um, down to Big Stuff Camp every year. It, it's a pretty long trip. I mean, 16, 17 hours. But over and over, you get the question, are we there yet? How much further? How much longer? Right? Um, I remember when we took our kids, Josh, Jesse, the younger ones, and this was back in the day we didn't. I don't know how parents do it today because we had really didn't pay attention to seatbelt laws back then. So they'd start whining. We'd get them up, walk them around. But, um, but again, that question over and over again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, we're expected to grow up, but, but you know, most of us never change in this regard. I love the Bible, and I love the story that we're going to be going through today because it just tells us how things are. It tells us how we are as people, right? And we often ask, are we there yet? Are we there yet? God's not in a hurry. We say, God, let's get me into this job quickly, into this house. God, I need to be in this financial condition. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But see, God knew. And again, it's a principle. God, God wasn't nearly, um, you know, God, God knew that where they were going wasn't nearly as important as the kind of people that they were becoming on the way. See, God would rather us take longer to get somewhere and be sure that we arrive as the right kind of people. So he's doing a work in this group of people, this Israelite. See, having a land flowing with milk and honey, that's what the scriptures describe uh, the promised land, but having a land flowing with milk and honey was not near as important as having a heart flowing with love and justice and faith. For us, a port flow, portfolio flowing with dollars it's not, or a job flowing with power is not nearly as important as having a life that flows with the, the fruit of the Spirit. So God leads them through the wilderness, right? Not many distractions in the desert. He had certain lessons that they needed to learn. In the wilderness, people are much more likely to pay attention to what God's saying. Sometimes in our own lives, we have to go through the desert, we have to go through the wilderness to get us to change, to get us to see things the way that they totally are. So we're going to go to wilderness school for a while here for the next few moments. Uh, if we learn some lessons from, from the Israelites, from what God was trying to teach them as he led them on this journey into the promised land. So, so again, to back it up, but the, the Israelite people, they had just been, um, they had just been rescued out of slavery. We could go back and read about the plagues that God put on the, nation of Israel, on the nation of Egypt, 10 plagues. We could read about how he parted the Red Sea and the Israelite people passed through on dry land, but then the waters came back and, and drowned the army. Miraculously, God has redeemed his people. He has rescued them. He has led them out of Egypt on the way to the promised land. 
And here we continue the story now in Exodus chapter 15. So we're kind of going backwards a little bit. It says this. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Three days into this journey. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Now again, three days into this journey. Think about what they've just witnessed just a few days prior. You know, and again, you'll have to catch up and read the story, but miraculous provision, miraculous intervention by the God of the universe. Things have just happened in their lives, and yet three days into the journey, God's at the wheel, and the kids are in the back seat, complaining, grumbling, are we there yet? What's going on? And what God does is he miraculously provides for them. He has Moses throw a piece of, water, a piece of wood into the water. The water turns from its bitterness and, and is able for them to drink, because God continues to provide for these people. So now they've got freedom. They've had miraculous guidance. In direction, they've, they've got this supernatural water to drink. Surely they're trusting God. Right? It would be in an all-time high right now. Surely they're going to be content and trust him. Let's move on in Exodus 16. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But here we, you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Now again, what were the, what, what were the jobs of the Israelites while they were in Egypt? Anybody seen the movie The Ten Commandments? I mean, they're slaves. It's not like they're just sitting around the, the meal at night, you know, eating fondue. Things aren't just provided like that. I mean, their, their, their concept had gotten distorted. See, discontent distorts our perspective, and it, and it twists our view of reality. And just a few weeks into this journey, they're looking back at the good old days where they were slaves. And they're thinking, God, did you bring us out here just to kill us? Again, think of all the things that God's already done for them on this just short journey so far. But see, discontent. It can infect us, can't it? It plays with your mind. It's easy when we're grumbling to have the truth distorted, to not be grateful. See, you lose perspective. You exaggerate how bad things are in your life right now, and, and, and you, you look through rose-colored glasses at the past and forget about some of the hardships that you went through, or you, you look at other people that are on social media and you think, wow, they've got no problems. It just distorts things. This grumbling, this, this discontent. We move on in Exodus chapter 16, verses 6 to 12. And I want you to pay attention and listen to one key word that God has Moses repeat over and over again in this. It says, Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that, we, that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Anybody pick up on the key word there? What was repeated over and over and over again? People were grumbling. Grumbling. But you know what we see in this story and throughout Scripture? Our God's amazing. Our God's amazing. He's, he's more patient than we are. right? And he keeps on providing for this stiff-necked people. And see, I think we're all prone to grumbling. We're all prone to, to focusing on negatives and, and, and to forget the God who provides for us. We've got to fight against this temptation. Nothing good comes from it. I think Josh uh, probably mentioned in Galatians, I think it's chapter 5 where it says, just a little bit of yeast and it affects the whole batch, right? So, so this grumbling, it's contagious. It, it, it can lead to other people grumbling. It's just not, not good for us. We continue on in the story. Exodus 16, chapter, verse 13, it says, That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. Remember, God had said, I'm going to give you meat in the evening. I'm going to give you bread in the morning. 
says, in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared in the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they didn't know what it was. So in other words, uh, we don't have it in this passage, but this, this bread that appeared in the morning was, was called manna. So you get the cards, right? And, and this manna, uh, Scripture tells us that it was like wafers made with honey. Made, tasted like wafers made from honey. So the sweet bread that God provided every, every morning for them. And the word manna simply means, what is it? What is it? So you can almost picture the people, uh, you know, I want to have a, brec- a bowl of what is it for breakfast, right? Maybe Frosted Flakes got the name from this. I don't know. We, we can see. But um, if you're a cool kind of pastor, like Josh, when he comes up and wears hats and stocking caps when he preaches, most of the people called what is it, Josh would have called it what it is, right? So. <laughs> it's kind of weak, I know, so. All right. So this what is it stuff, never seen it before. Miraculous, every morning, flakes that they could gather up. Right? So what's God trying to teach them? What's God trying to teach them here? Later on, in reflection, Moses tells us much of what's going on. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, and again, he's reflecting on this journey. They're, they're on the verge of going into the promised land, and he says this. He says, God humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with the manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And it wasn't, just, it wasn't just the food and water that God provided. In verse 4 it says, Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Can you imagine what it must be like traveling through a desert? Right? The wear and tear on your shoes, on your clothes, and yet miraculously, miraculously, none of the clothes they wore out. You know, I've been doing weddings, I think, for like 12 years. I think some of us guys get this principle a little bit more. And, and um, I've been doing weddings for 12 years. And, you know, I looked at the picture of the first wedding that I did. And I thought about it. And, you know, I had this suit on 12 years ago that I've worn for every single wedding since. Now, I'm starting to put this to the test because some of the, some of the hymns are starting to come undone and stuff. And, again, I, I think some of us guys get this a little bit better because I've looked at the pictures. And I've probably done 60, 70, 80, 90 weddings during this time. Same suit each time. And yet when I look at the pictures at many of the weddings that my wife too went, went to, she's got a different dress every single time. Right? So you ladies got to kind of trust God in this, all right? So these things don't go out. But again, can you imagine we're in the same clothes for 40 years? 40 years. Right? Seeing this daily picture, did they ever just stop and think, wow, this doesn't make any sense. God's providing meat for them. God's provided water for them. God's provided this manna, this what is it stuff, every single day, every single day. Fed them, clothed them. God was taking care of his people. He says, I'm enough. Trust me. Trust me. But there's an important rule about manna gathering that's really the main gist of what I want to talk about this morning. It's in Exodus chapter 16. We go on. It says, the Israelites, they did as they were told. So some gathered much, so they would go out in the morning, gather this manna. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who had gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until the morning. Now here's the principle that we want to go through. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until the morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. No one is to keep any of it, right, until the morning. One day at a time. Gather enough manna just to get you through that day. And here's the principle that we find, the manna principle. One day at a time. We're to trust God one day at a time for our provision daily. God will provide. He's going to take care of you. Trust God for this day, for right now. Don't need to worry about tomorrow. But people being people in this situation... And, and we can relate to it, right? Some of them, they got anxious. Some were afraid. Some were greedy. Some people thought that they could beat the system, thought that they'd be clever, that they'd get an edge, that they wouldn't follow God's commands. And, and what happened to it? Boiled. It was rotten. God had something to teach them and something to teach us. And I, I think God calls us to an amazing, wonderful, abundant life. But it won't happen unless we get this principle down. And as I was going through it, you know, uh, I was thinking, you know, this, this manna principle, trusting God one day at a time, just for today's provisions, not, not tomorrow, not a year down the road, but just 
one day at a time. You think Jesus might have had this Exodus story in mind when he spoke his famous Sermon on the Mount? See, he taught us to pray, right? A prayer that many of us have said is, says, give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Take care of me today, God. I'm going to trust you to provide and take care of me, for me today just, just one day at a time. Give me manna. See, I'm, I'm not asking for any guarantees for tomorrow. I'm going to put my life into your hands, and I'm going to trust you just for today. This financial situation, this court date that's coming up, my problem with, with infertility, my singleness, I'm, I'm wanting a spouse, or, or my marriage is, is on the rocks, or my biopsy or scan results, my wayward children, my business is struggling. See, God, I, I'm going to plan, I'm, I'm going to think about the future, I think that's wise, and I'm going to work, but, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to obey you. Just for today, I'm going to put you, put you to the test in this. I'm going to trust you and that you're going to keep your word and that you will provide for me one day at a time. One day at a time. Matthew 6, 34, it goes on in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and Jesus tells the people, he says, you know, he says, look at the birds of the air. He says, they don't gather or reap or store away in barns, and he says, yet I feed them. Father takes care of them. He says, look at the flowers of the field. He says, not even Solomon and all of his wealth and splendor was clothed like one of these. And then he says, but you, he goes, you're much more worthy. You're, you're much more uh, of value and worth to our God. He says, if he takes care of those things, don't you think he's going to take care of you? And this is what Jesus pins. This is what he says in Matthew 6, 34. He says, therefore, just don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Trust me. Trust me for one day at a time. See, worrying, basically, Jesus says, does nothing but shorten our life. God says, I'm going to really take care of you. I've written a whole book. It's giving you examples, and I've come through every single time. But you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust me one day at a time. If you worry about tomorrow, then you're going to worry your whole life long. See, we're to come to God, and, and again, not asking for guarantees about tomorrow. I don't ask for answers to questions that I'm not being asked. We're not to ask for the ability to cross a bridge that, that we've not even reached yet. God, just today, give me your grace, your mercy, your wisdom, your counsel, uh, just for today. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to do the same thing again, and I'm going to trust you that your mercies are new each day. See, what if we as followers of Jesus Christ made our life just an adventure in trusting God one day at a time? How freeing would this be? What abundant life is offered to us. It's a humbling principle for me. I am a worrier. My default mode, it seems to go to all the what ifs, all, all the worries. That that's kind of comes natural for me. I'm I'm worried and I can grumble easily. But you know, when I when I thought about it, when I'm worrying, it's rare when I'm worrying about others. In other words, it's usually about me, about my own agenda, about my own projects, about what people might be thinking about me, what my future is going to look like. When we worry, oftentimes we're just preoccupied with self. And we carry around a burden that we don't have to carry. A foolish burden that takes life away. About nine years ago, my worrying led me to a complete nervous breakdown. Didn't help me. Never does. Never helps any of us. It led to me to being, having weeks of just being incapacitated, of, of just being frozen by anxiety. See, from a human standpoint... The Apostle Paul, he had a whole lot to worry about, right? Josh has been, again, going through Galatians that Paul wrote. Paul wrote basically half the books in the New Testament, right? And he was responsible for bringing the gospel message basically to the entire non-Jewish world. He went through incredible hardships and, and difficulties. He was afflicted with some kind of thorn in his side that he asked God to take away, that God wouldn't, that, that God said, look, I want you to keep this to keep you humble. Right? But he was confronted with you know, with all kinds of false teachers. He was beaten. He was thrown in prison. And there was a passage that when I went through my stuff, when, it, when I was able to start coming out of it and start to function, I memorized the entire book of Philippians. The main theme is joy, but there's a portion of it from Philippians chapter 4 that I repeat over and over and over again. Say it to myself constantly. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. God's near. Remember, it says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. He says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The God tells the Israelites, trust me, I'll provide man a principle one day at a time. Paul tells us, don't worry, trust God one day at a time. Jesus says, you think God won't provide for you? Trust him one day at a time. So the question is, can we live our lives according to this kind of principle? So you're going to be tempted this week to worry about money, worry about your kids, worry about relationships, your job, your future, a tough meeting that's coming up, something that you think that you, that you have to have that you couldn't live without, the future of our country, COVID, getting sick, right? the direction of those world wars. We tend to worry a lot. And there really seems to be a lot to worry about. But instead, what if we just turned to God? What if we remembered? What if we kept in mind this man of principle and say, God, I'm going to trust you that you're going to resource me for today. You're going to provide all that I need. And then when I wake up again tomorrow, you're going to do the same thing every day of my life. Enough wisdom, enough courage, enough patience, enough love just to handle the day one day at a time. I think if we did that, if we live fully in the moment, one day at a time. What an adventure. What would God have in store for us? Right? I think, again, the, the, the extent to which we can experience the joy that God offers in the kingdom of God right now definitely relates to getting this principle. And it takes a while for, it to learn, for us to learn it. Right? This man of principle it took the, the Israelites several, several years. God is trying to teach us this principle to his children in the wilderness. They're in school, but they're slow learners. Right? So, and, and so are we sometimes. That's why I gave you this card. I don't know, maybe, maybe you just need to stick it in a window somewhere when you start to worry. Think about manna. Think about what God's done for us. Maybe if you like to eat these things, these Rice Krispie treats, you can eat it, remember it. If you don't like to eat them, you can stick it somewhere because who knows what it's made out of, what is it, and it'll probably last forever. Right? You can do that. But we go on with the story in Exodus 17. The people are thirsty again. You'd think by now that they'd have a little faith. And be willing to, to wait on God or at least pray to him. But instead, they once again, they whine, they grumble, they moan, they complain to Moses. Exodus 17. It says the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Haven't we gone through this before? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff which you, with, with, with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And I wanted to, to highlight on something there in verse 7 because really here's the complaint. Here's the question that the people had that day. They said, is the Lord among us or not? Right now, again, think of all that they've witnessed, all that they've seen on this journey previous to their just journey, and they're asking a question that we, we can read and look at and say, are they crazy? How do they not see? Is the Lord among us or not, they say. This is ridiculous. What has God done? The plagues, the, the crossing of the Red Sea, destroying Pharaoh's army, manna, quail, water, all these things. But again, I want to say this, before we judge them too harshly, let's do a little reflection. See, as Christ followers, right, we believe some pretty crazy things that we read about in the Gospels. These books, first four books in the New Testament, tell us the story of Jesus from his birth all the way until his death and resurrection and ascension back to heaven. See, we believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. We believe that this man, Jesus, was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, we believe that he performed some pretty crazy miracles, right? Drove out demons, cured leprosy, blindness, seizures, deafness, muteness, bleeding problems. We believe that he calmed storms with just a word, that he walked on water, that he fed thousands of people with just a few fish and a, a few loaves of bread, that he brought people back from the dead. The apostle John, he wrote his gospel, and he said, I suppose, using some hyperbole, he said, I suppose that if I wrote down everything that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the books that I would write. 
So Jesus did so much among the people. Right? And it doesn't stop there. We believe that, that this Jesus, because of his, his great love for us, because of God's great love for us, that, that Jesus was sent onto the scene and that he bore our sins on the cross and that he rose from the dead. We're going to be celebrating that in a special way over Easter, right? But he took our punishment, the punishment that we deserve. Right? And now, because of what Jesus has done on our behalf, we can commune with God. See, and we believe that, that, again, that he rose from the dead, that he is alive and active right now. And amazingly, when Jesus was on the scene, he told his followers, he says, I've got something even greater in store. He says, once I rise from the dead, I'm going to ascend back to the Father, but it's to your benefit, which if I would have been a follower, I'd been like, how could it be more beneficial than you being with us? And he says, it's going to be to your benefit because I'm going to send the helper the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And now where, where me, I'm kind of limited right now and where I'm at, he's, he's going to, to dwell inside of you, not in a cloud, not, not in, in a pillar of fire, but he's going to, to indwell every single believer in Jesus Christ. And he's gonna, he's gonna lead you. He's gonna guide you. He's gonna teach you, prompt you. He's gonna remind you of scripture. He's gonna be pointing you towards Jesus. Some crazy stuff, some crazy stuff. But maybe what's even crazier, again, with all of that, and we believe that, we proclaim that when we're baptized, when we follow Jesus Christ, yet we believe all that, and yet we don't trust him daily, that he'll provide for us, that he's got our back. You know, I do a lot of counseling with people, and I honestly, um, sometimes they're, I'm speaking with people, and, and they're telling me their situation, their story, their past, and in my mind as I'm listening to them, I'm thinking, I have no idea what to say here. This seems hopeless. How in the world is this situation ever going to change? I have no idea. But then I, the cool thing is that I think to myself, and I, I normally pray and think, I don't have to know. Because the God who has no limits, no boundaries, no degree of difficulty says, I will provide one day at a time for these people, for you, for everyone that calls my name. Right? Trust me, he says. One day at a time, and I'll come through. I always do. You can bank on it. Now again, in my warrior question and mentality, you might be like me and you say, really, Herc? See, I've seen plenty of situations where it seems like God hasn't come through. Right? Plenty of situations where it seems like God doesn't take care of his people. I mean, people get sick and die, right? Sometimes it's little kids. Sometimes it's people that just go through a brutal ordeal of suffering and, and, and people even right now, Christians are being martyred all over the world and, and there are natural disasters and, and just it seems like just random acts of, of tragedy all the time around us. So if God provides, what's the deal? See, again, this is, this is getting a little read onto me. I, I read in scripture where Jesus says that, look, God will take care of the birds of the air. But then I think, well, you know, last night I was driving and one flew into my windshield. What happened on that one, God? And I think these are valid questions. And, you know, as we go through the story, I, I think for a long time, I thought that Moses, the story of Moses, and, and I'll tell you about it here in just a second, but, but I thought that Moses, in all of Scripture, kind of got screwed over more than anybody else. See, in Numbers 30, we could read, uh, or in Numbers 20, we could read that, that people are, again, they're grumbling, there's, there's no water available to them, and, and, and God gives Moses some instructions. And he says, I want you to take your staff, and I want you to speak to the rock, and, and out of the rock's going to come gushing water. And, and we're told that Moses went to this and, and didn't quite follow the instruction of God. And he struck the rock a couple times with his staff, and, and water came out, and God provided for the people. But God was angry with Moses. He said, Moses, you didn't, you didn't trust me. You didn't follow me what I said. And because of that, Moses, I'm not going to allow you to enter into the promised land. Now, Again, in, in my mindset, I'm thinking, come on, God. For 40 years, he's put up with these whining babies that are constantly saying, are we there yet? You know, when God says go, they say we don't want to go. When God says don't go, they say we want to go. And Moses is put up with that. And out of anger, and, and, and he strikes the rock and doesn't, doesn't pay attention, you know, to what God had said. But God said, no, no. Because of that, you're not going to enter the promised land. You're not going to enter. And, and again, Maybe we don't get the full story. Maybe Moses did it out of some pride, thinking, hey, taking credit for the miracle, whatever it might be. But I thought for a long time, wow, that just seems very harsh. I mean, this one, this man that you used to lead this nation and teach all these lessons, he doesn't get to go into the promised land. Tell, one day it just kind of hit me. I don't know if it was listening to a sermon or whatever, but I'm reading in Matthew chapter 17. 
This tells of the, the Mount of Transfiguration. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James, and they led them up a mountain by themselves. And there Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the, as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them, who? Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Can you imagine? Imagine? I mean, God didn't allow Moses to go into the promised land, cut his life short, and yet here we read that I don't think Moses was screwed over too bad. He goes to heaven and he's talking with Elijah, talking with Jesus, right? face to face. See, God always comes through. He knows what he's doing, sees the whole picture that we don't see. We can trust him for his provision one day at a time, and sometimes it's going to seem like it doesn't go our way, but God's got it under control. He sees it all. And even death, in our eyes, might be a really tragic, horrible thing. God says, no, you've graduated to paradise. My mom died about three, three and a half years ago, and for the last two years of her life was just in massive pain. You know, disease was ravaging her body, just wasting away. And our prayer over and over again was, God, either heal her or take her. And it was just, she cried. I'd never seen my mom cry. And, it, and, and, and I honestly, trying to make sense of it, it's like, why, God? I mean, where are you? And, and again, he provided for her one day at a time. But you know what? My mom and dad always had, they loved each other, were married 60 years, but they, they never had this, it didn't seem like it was real close. You'd go in and dad would be in his room watching sports and mom would be in another room on the iPad. But, but those last two years, it was almost every time I'd go over, the dad would be sitting there rubbing my mom's back, just providing and loving. And, and again, God is not in a hurry. God provides, but he teaches us lessons. And, and I learned a lot just from watching mom and dad, and I know my siblings did as well. But see, there's so much more we can talk about from this Exodus story. But it doesn't really end well. It's kind of sad. This pattern of trusting God, uh, not trusting God continues. And, and again, the people grumble. They, they do the opposite of what God says. And and, um, and their disasters and, and several casualties. And again, they continue to wander. But eventually, after 40 years, they're on the border of the promised land. God's brought them through this journey. People that were born in Egypt, now this generation is getting old. And, and God has Moses send out 12 spies into the promised land. Kind of a, a cool time again. Think of all that God's done. 12 spies go out. They come back to report to Moses what they had seen. 10 of them come back and said, wow, this promised land is not such a good idea. We can't go in there. The people that inhabit this nation that we have to take over, they're giants. We look like grasshoppers compared to them. The people saw themselves. The cherished people of God, the people that God had chosen, they saw themselves as little grasshoppers. And their foes is this enormous giant. They're on the border of the promised land. And yet they said, no, we can't go in there. Two of them, fortunately. Caleb and Joshua came back and they said just the opposite. They're like, we can go in there. We've got God on our side. No problem. We'll take them down. But you know what? God gave basically the people that had wandered through the desert for 40 years their wish. He says, this generation that started off in Egypt, that knew nothing but slavery, then saw my provision, all that I'd done, they're stiff-necked people. They haven't learned the lessons and I'm not going to let them go into the promised land. And he didn't. And that generation died off. And, and again, I'm guessing that God knew what he was doing. He couldn't have that negativity. He couldn't have that, that, that yeast, that sin infect the whole nation. And he allowed them to die off before they reached the promised land. Kind of a sad story, isn't it? Didn't quite get it. Think of all they missed out on. We can read in the book of Joshua and, and on. Think of all the, the things that God did for them that, that they never got to experience. The peace, the calm, the trust that was offered to them. They never learned the man principle. What a shame. I guess I'd say to us, to me, I think it'd be a greater shame if we miss it. With all that we know, with all the examples that we have, with the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. We've got a church, a community of people that should be encouraging us and re reminding us of how great our God is. The songs that we sing, you know, that we proclaim as, as we praise God, do we really believe them? Do we live them out and trust that God will provide for us one day at a time? So again, here's a challenge to you guys. Some things are going to happen this week. Guaranteed. Jesus says in this world you're going to have problems. Guaranteed. 
There are going to be some things that happen that might lead you to to temptation, to, to worry, to grumble. Take the card. Read the story. Finish it up for yourself. Remember what God has done for the Israelites. Remember what we have through, through Jesus. Remember the Holy Spirit and the nudgings and the promptings and the leanings and the, 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 the leadings that he gives to us. And trust God. Trust God. One day at a time. Let's see what he does. See, God calls us to abundant life in Christ. The evil one comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, but it's only going to come if you trust him one day at a time. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, um, just, first of all, we just come to you humbly, Father, just acknowledging that, that, um, that we're sinners and that we're weak on our own. And I think that's probably a lot of the point of this story and in Exodus and and throughout Scripture, that we are weak, that we can't do it on our own, that the proper response, the proper lifestyle, the proper mindset is to completely trust you, be 100% dependent on you for our needs, for your provision, one day at a time. Father, help us to to reflect upon Scripture, help us to reflect upon uh, what you've done and provided for us in our own life and, and help us to think about what's true and noble and right and pure and lovely. Help us to think of the gospel message as Josh mentioned earlier. Let us be saturated um, with the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, help us to be lights. As you called the Israelites, that was, that was your main job for them, to be a light to the world, to point them towards God. Help us, Father, in our lives to live as lights, to trust you one day at a time. And I, I guarantee, Father, that our life will go better the peace and the calm, but also it'll be attractive to other people and they'll want to know what we have and we can give you all the glory and praise that you alone deserve. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face message. Can we give uh, Pastor Eric a round of applause? Hopefully you were encouraged, um, challenged. I know I was, and uh, I am grateful to have a God who guides us one day at a time. I'm grateful for the story of the nation of Israel, uh, that he called them out, that he guided them one day at a time. And I maybe inherited uh, some of my tendencies to be um, pessimistic a little bit at times, like I can grumble, think about things in a negative light. And, uh, and I think there are some positives to that, some negatives. And one of those is I was hearing that story. I'm like, at the time when God's leading those people, there were also nations who weren't being led. And, uh, and now we're a chosen people. We're a holy nation. And I'm very excited for all of us. We have a God who leads us today, who provides for us tomorrow and the next day and the next day, one day at a time. But I also know that there are people who don't have that. And there are people that you know, and there are people that you love, and there are people that hopefully you're praying for that do not live in the reality that we're called to live in as believers. And, uh, and, and, and really, there's only one group of people who are called to be the spokesman for God, uh, to be his ambassadors, uh, to be his messengers to the world. And guess who that is? That's us. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and so I just want to encourage you, look around and try and fill your row next week. Let's try, and f- let's try and continue to fill these seats to where they can hear this story, to where people can hear this story, not so that a building can be full, but so that lives can be changed. And, uh, and so we have a great opportunity over the next couple weeks, which is we're going to start kind of announcing just some dates. But please invite. Be an inviter. Get people here. I'm speaking to myself. Let's all of us. Let's let's let's. Let's kind of take up our mantle here as, as, God's, as God's ambassadors and do our best to get people uh, in these doors. And so with that said, we have some stuff coming up. What do we have tonight? Tonight we have The Edge, which is our student kind of meetings on Sunday nights over at Arnold. A lot of fun stuff going on right now. Um, there's some drama going there's on. There's some right drama now. going on. There is. There's a lot of drama, a lot of controversy. And so if you're on Instagram, we'd encourage you to follow OBCC underscore students. Even if you're not a student, you can check out the drama. You can even weigh in. There's a lot going on. Um, and uh, and we, would, we would love to have, yeah, students up here. And where, where are we meeting tonight? We're, we're here, right? Oh, yeah. We're, yeah, we're, we're here. Thing. It's the edge at Oak Bridge City. So the event will start at 530. It'll go on 
on till eight, and then the people who like to play basketball can stay later because I'm going to be playing with uh, those kiddos later. So we'd love to have your students. Um, uh, we believe that we're, we're kind of creating an environment for middle schoolers and high schoolers alike, boys and girls, to come and have a good time and hopefully meet some people and, most importantly, connect with God. And so we'll be here tonight, 530. Uh, we have, we'll have pizza. Um, well, yeah, it's going to be a good it's going to be a good night. It's a typical youth pastor. We'll have pizza. <laughs> um, and so anyways, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to have them. What else uh, we got? Um, next weekend, we're going to start kicking off our Easter festivities. Friday night up here, we have Easter Jam, which is like our family kids service. So if you're either serving, which we're asking anyone who doesn't have kiddos to serve so that this family can, can enjoy the service, um, please sign up. And also, if you're just planning on attending, please sign up so that we can get numbers right and everything. Yeah, and you'll get updates for that. But if you're serving, we want you showing up around 5 p.m. We'll have dinner provided for you. We'll have a good time. And uh, and we have about 25 families signed up for that, which is exciting. A bunch of volunteers. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I thought it was cool. Um, and so, yeah, we would love to. We'd love for you to sign up if you have not yet. And then Good Friday, the following Friday night, we're meeting at Arnold at 7 p.m. It's my favorite night of the year. Our city team, uh, worship team, will be leading there, and uh, and we'll be doing our best to lead you to the cross. And then Easter Sunday morning, we have two services here at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, to make room for your friends and your family and for more more and more people to come and hear the greatest story ever told. Uh, but in order for that to kind of be a good plan and be successful, you need to bring your family and your friends and those people who need to hear the greatest story ever told. And so we'd encourage you to invite, and we will see you all there. And uh, next Saturday morning, next Saturday morning, we have our men's breakfast. Breakfast starts at 6.45 a.m. at the Arnold location. Come be encouraged. Meet some men who are trying to follow Jesus as well. And uh, I think that's all we got. First-timers, last thing. First timers, we love you. Grateful you're here. Uh, we're getting more and more each week, which is exciting. Uh, and we would love to meet you. So right outside these doors, there are people with shirts say, how can I help? Uh, we'd love to just say hi, uh, give you a free t-shirt, tell you thanks for coming. Uh, so with that said, we will see you uh, next Sunday morning uh, at 10 a.m. We're excited. See ya.